forensic odontology human rights to uh, enlighten us today regarding humanitarian forensic odontology uh, it is a very important topic Uh, uh, right now uh, around the world and with the pandemic on us i think it is very relevant today uh, that we hear uh, dr milio speak to us thank you for taking out from your schedule sir thank you thank you dr emlata good afternoon to everyone i'm very glad to be here and share with you this topic i will not show you particular uh, talk about a topic which doesn't show too many images of human remains uh one of the topic the topic i would like to share with you is first of humanitarian forensic odontology the first question that everyone is uh, is asking is uh, the most the life's most persistent and urgent question is what are you doing for others just to remember what dr martin luther king told us asked and uh, I ask this question to to myself. I ask this question to colleagues in forensics and I say what about forensics? Can we do something for others? And uh, if we deal about if we talk about forensic odontology or forensic dentistry, we all know and we are all aware that we work in uh, some specific areas of forensics which includes human identification, age estimation, bite mark analysis, but also malpractice and dental damage and insurance areas now this field of expertise this field of forensics actually are involved in so many other areas of crime and scientific investigations first of all in mass disaster disaster victims identification in war and other conflicts victim identification we are involved also of to see of a missing or unidentified body or human remains we also are involved in mass and border control where we refer to age estimation we could be involved in evidence collection and analysis in the field of homicide domestic and sexual violence but also child abuse and dental neglect we can be involved of course in the analysis of uh, dental evidence on the crime scene we can be asked to do assessment in case of torture in case of victims recognition of human trafficking and of course considering also patient rights and malpractice so we can be involved in situations like mass graves exhumations on the need of performing human identification we can be asked to do assessment in child abuse cases where we can find signs of abuse or neglect we can find physical signs in the areas of neck and face which are mostly involved in child abuse on an average of 50 to 70% of cases we are involved as a fundamental resource in the age estimation of in the age assessment of uh, unaccompanied minors migrants we have been involved in this in this issue with professor divella since 2006 when we asked the, the uh, court of bari to establish a multidisciplinary approach which would already start with the involvement of uh, medical examiner and odontologist which was not performed before then and this is how we perform it nowadays at the university of turin performing what is called not only multidisciplinary assessment but also an holistic approach with the inclusion of social and psychological interviews of course being in italy specifically but not because italy is the only country we also face the migration flow and unfortunately we also have to face with the victims of migration the victims of migration which are which are uh, several which are thousands there are uh, there are uh, more than 3 334000 uh, dead migrants traveling around the mediterranean sea some of them are uh, dying on the soil most of them die during the path 
on the sea. And uh, if you can see all these dots that you see here in these slides are actually the people that have that lost their lives trying to cross the Mediterranean Sea to reach European border. All these blue dots is not just the sea, they represent each dot, each point represent a dead person. And as you can see, unfortunately, out of these uh, 34,361 deaths recorded, uh, just over a thousand have a name and an identity. All the rest of these are buried as unidentified person. So we end up to the idea of promoting uh, forensic odontology on an humanitarian aspect, which we call humanitarian forensic odontology. The humanitarian forensic odontology, which becomes the use and the application of pro bono services or consultations in forensic caseworks, pay attention, where dental evidence is involved. So every forensic casework where we find, we could collect, we can analyze dental evidence. Dental evidence is involved and can be pivotal in crime investigations, age estimation, and identification of human remains. But this casework, don't find yet or cannot count on the work and the service of all forensic odontologists. So having the need of forensic odontology assessment on one side, you have humanitarian forensic odontologists which are volunteering forensic odontologists available to perform, to serve pro bono and work in forensic consultations. That's why we also decided one of the, the paths that could uh, allow us, uh, a group of several colleagues from that different countries, one of the paths to promote humanitarian forensic odontology services was the creation of a group which was created in 2015 and which became an association, a formal association in January 2019 the Association Forensic Odontology for Human Rights. You find us in uh, all major uh, social media. We also have a website, of course, and you can find our profile in Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And this is our uh, logo. And uh, one of the specific aspects is that this is the only volunteering association worldwide related to forensics and forensic odontology and to this end to become a member has no cost to become a member of AFOR you don't pay any fee you have to read and share the ideas and values and goals of our bylaws and then you have to send of course some specific and fill in a specific form this is when we start when it started. It started on the 5th of May 2015 during the annual Interpol DVI meeting in Lyon, where I was there with other colleagues. And the DVI meeting in Lyon uh, is a, a group of experts which include also a sub working group on forensic odontology. We had the, uh, this idea during that meeting. And that's why I like to remember that day because this is the group picture of 2015 meeting. And you see that's the floor of the Interpol or central office in Lyon. So people who want to join or would like to consider joining us, first of all, have to have an humanitarian attitude and, and would have to have a, as a goal also to work on a volunteering basis. Uh, and they have to share, of course, the goals of the association, which are summarized in Article 2 of our bylaws, where you can see that the association has been established for the purpose of fostering exchange of ideas, experiences, and knowledge in the field of forensic odontology, human rights, and ethics, 
but pay attention not only to forensic odontology, also all disciplines involved in crime investigations and human rights violations. For this reason, in our association, several colleagues who are pathologists, fingerprints experts, and anthropologists, because even if the association is called, yes, Lanshin. Yeah, uh, Professor Milio, I think your screen is not moving. We are not able to see anything on the screen. We can only see the humanitarian forensic odontology heading. Oh, I see. Yeah, and also as you are the host, uh, so uh, you can admit everyone who are in a waiting room. So please admit. Of all. course. Yes, yes, yes. Sorry about that. Okay. So, which was the last slide you were able to see, Ranjit? Uh, that was the heading, Forensic Odontology Identification. So, can you, uh, yeah, back. Uh, Here. Back. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this was the slide we are able to see. And after that... So, you saw that, because I moved on the screen. Sorry about that. So, yeah, no problem. Did you, see, did you see this picture? Yeah, this is the logo we can see. Okay. So, you can also please note the profiles on social media which you can decide to follow because actually i forgot to add in this media we also have a youtube channel where you can find some of the interviews that we create during international meetings so we are present not only in twitter facebook instagram linkedin we have of course a website and we also have a youtube channel this is the picture I was mentioning. I was telling you, we started the group Forensic Odontology for Human Rights on the 5th of May 2015 during the annual scientific meeting on disaster victim identification, which has been held in Lyon and in the last years has been also held in Singapore in the other uh, Eastern Interpol headquarters. Uh, this is the group picture of the meeting. This is the floor of the meeting or headquarters. idea came up because in this group, in this interpol, we have the meeting several sub working groups, and there is also a sub group of friends which is chaired by Dr. Irina Davidson from Sweden. Uh, to join AFOR, you have to, first of all, have a humanitarian attitude, as I was telling you, and you have to be ready to volunteer in the field of forensics. The other issue, the other important issue is that uh, you have to understand, share our values and our goals, which are listed in Article 2 of our bylaws, which I was reading before. Basically, we foster the exchange of ideas, experiences, and knowledge in the field of forensic odontology, human rights, and ethics. But our association is not only close to forensic odontologists, but is open to all forensic scientists who are involved in crime investigations and human rights violations. And I was telling you, we also have members who are fingerprints experts, uh, bio, uh, bio, forensic uh, biologists, uh, and also forensic pathologists, and some anthropologists. One of the other aspects is to promote research, education, and other scholarly activities, uh, thereby increasing the availability of resources in these disciplines. And that's why we uh, focus uh, on several uh, meetings where we promote our association with the goal of creating network. Uh, here are listed some of, of the meetings where we were present uh, by me or by other founding members of AFOR starting in 2016. And you can see all the places where actually I have been in order to promote our association, our values, and the idea of promoting forensic odontology for best practice in human identification and age estimation. And as you can see, this presence 
It started in 2015 in Lyon, and it has been going on in Saudi Arabia, in Indonesia, in, in, Czech, in the Czech Republic, in Romania, in Singapore, in the United Arab Emirates, in Belgium, in Nepal, in the USA, in Gujarat, in India, in, the, in Bucharest, in Romania, in India again, in Chandigarh, look now, and this year in February in Sudan, in Khartoum, during the seventh Impafo meeting. Uh, in order to focus better and have a, a better a detailed idea of the goals we wanted to achieve through our association, during, after the election which took place last year, and uh, in which uh, I was elected president for the term 2019-2020. Uh, and we also elected the president term 2021 and 2022, which is Professor Mlata Pandey. We, in the board, in a board meeting, we focused on uh, what could be or should be specific goals of our association in order to be an association which promotes specifically um, uh, achievements, which we, we try to achieve since last year and until the year 2023. And these goals are eight. You can see these goals shown in our social media. I just would like you to list them together with you. Goal number one, is dealing about the human rights of the dead, which is the, the promoting the importance of restoring human rights of unidentified human remains, protect the right of the dead to have a name and an identity, and of course promote best practices in age estimation and human identification. Goal number two, human identification action, is to improve all those actions which could be useful in order to improve human identification, but improving it with the systematic involvement of forensic odontologists who must perform a complete dental autopsy. Now, a complete dental autopsy is an autopsy where you, as an odontologist, have to collect not only dental data from the collection, from the visual collection, but I have to perform also, uh, also X-ray of teeth. And uh, Emilio, I think you muted yourself. Okay, sorry. Goal, goal number three. And in between, you admit everyone because you are the host. Uh, I, uh, Rajit, I modified now the setting. Now everyone who log in will enter automatically. So you, they will not be put in the waiting room anymore so that I don't interrupt. The, Thank the, you, so it's easier. It was... Uh, uh, useful at the beginning, but now we can allow people because everyone is uh, registered and uh, as police says, we know where you are. <laughs> so we know where you are. So goal number three is promote international partnership. And this is the reason why we are present in all, if not most, if not all international meetings and congresses related to forensic odontology and the forensic sciences. Uh, as you are aware, unfortunately, because of the COVID-19, most of the, practically all meetings were postponed. So we were supposed to attend the International Dental Ethics and Law Society International Conferences in Belgium in <coughs> September, and also the International Organization of Forensic Odontology Congress in uh, in Dubrovnik in Croatia, but they were post uh, they were mo both postponed in 2021. 
and uh, I will show you that we have also our own meetings already scheduled since last year in September 2021. So we, we promote a, a, a partnership with international organizations, with forensic organizations, with NGOs and civil protection organizations, all those organizations which are involved in humanitarian action and human rights protection. Goal number four, humanitarian forensic odontology, which is the topic of this presentation, is the actual action, is the actual availability of forensic odontologists to perform forensic dental services where there is the need of a forensic odontological assessment, which is in the field of human identification and in the field of age assessment, age estimation. Uh, in our goal, we, will, we want to make a stronger forensic odontology. By this goal, we mean to create occasions, opportunities, and areas where our forensic odontology can be easily uh, circulated, promoted by all those colleagues who are interested. That's why we started, and uh, of course, I'm very, very happy that also other universities are sharing this idea of not stopping, not stopping education and training because we have restrictions, because we have lockdown, but actually taking the opportunity of having a wider explosion of this training through the social media, through the, uh, through the, through the online tool like Zoom, which allows us today, yesterday, and the coming days with the other colleagues, Dr. Evian Toro, and Professor Emlata Pande and Dr. Ranjit Singh to share their experience, their knowledge, and their uh, and, and their cases through this tool without be without having to take a flight, without having to support the travel. Because everyone here, out of these colleagues, and we are almost 200 this morning, we are safe home, and we can share and we can share education, training, ideas related to forensics and forensic odontology. One of these goals is achieved using these tools, like the one we are using in this forensic odontology uh, webinars series. The sixth to, uh, goal is to provide awareness on human identification, especially considering the missing of children, and offer for free the so-called human identification kit, which is a tool which is being given to families in order to share identifying data of a child free of charge. And also, we would like to work in working groups, as we have already established, in order to provide a definitive method of age assessment and adulthood determination. Because our uh, our discipline is a great resource within the field of uh, age assessment, but there isn't still an homogeneous way of assessing age. There isn't uh, a, con a general consensus, a world consensus on what to do. And it is our duty as experts in forensic odontology to highlight that uh, the dental method is one of the most powerful methods in the assessment of uh, minor or adulthood age. And for this reason, dental methods for age estimation should always be applied when there is a request of performing age estimation. Finally, goal number eight, uh, dental evidence in crimes against vulnerable persons are all those areas of crimes where we could find or police could collect dental evidence which could be used in a criminal proceedings in order to uh, have uh, evidence useful for the crime investigation itself. And of course, dental evidence can be found in child abuse cases, in torture, in domestic violence, in homicide, in sexual abuse, in THB trafficking, in human beings because we consider that the presence of bite mark lesions and bite mark evidence is very well distributed in all these kinds of crimes. So 
going to the specific areas of how we can practically use our knowledge and enhance the identification of missing and identified person, we passed from the unidentified person where we have no clue to a, to a generic profile on the right where we have pieces of ideas, where we have clues that can narrow the, uh, the, the, the search of the compatible people, of the compatible missing people that can be uh, used in order to uh, establish the identity of an unidentified human remains that, of course, cannot be visually recognized. Don't forget that we are dealing with dead people that unfortunately cannot be visually recognized because they are carbonized, skeletonized, fragmented or carbonized. And here I, sh I would like to share with you some I issues, uh, some figures related to the Italian figures in the field of missing persons and unidentified persons. There are almost 60,000 missing persons reports in Italy. And uh, there has been also a collection of how many people are still unidentified in my country in my country, there are 2,643 unidentified human remains which still need are waiting for an identity. So the University of Turin last June, together with, the, with the AFOR, decided to create this informative campaign called Identify Me, which is a video that you can see on YouTube a video that uh, is actually addressed to families and of the missing person and to law enforcement authority, a video which you can find in several languages, translated in several languages. Of course, you have it in English. You can find it in Italian. You have a version translated by Dr. Basim Mohammed Riawi in Arabic. You have uh, it translated in Portuguese by Dr. Khalid Makul from the University of Coimbra. And you also have a version translated in Hindi by Professor Mlata Pandey, where this, you can find this resource in this uh, YouTube addresses, which is our YouTube channel. So what is this informative campaign? This informative campaign has the goal of raising awareness to families and to law enforcement, but specifically to families of the missing persons, on what you can still find in home, what can still have a very important resource inside the dental, inside the human identification process. And of course, this is to raise awareness to, for, to families that they still have or they could still have in the house X-rays of the face, X-rays of the skull, OPGs of the missing persons that can be transferred to police. It's the, it's the, it is important that they can be uh, addressed uh, also information related to dental implants because the missing persons may have uh, done uh, uh, a dental implant restorations in the mouth and all dentists are aware that implants have a specific shape that you can see in the x-rays and they also have a specific uh, label which identifies the implants and that information is an identifying features which can narrow the search when we have human remains where to, we have to perform a dental autopsy. Also, we have to ask and address questions to families related to the uh, potential traumas that the missing person has faced in the past because traumas to face and jaws creates fractures and these fractures are treated with the titanium screws and plates which of course can be found as you can see on x-rays and maybe families are not aware that this information is very important when you have to perform and human identification. Also, we as dentists deliver to patients full or partial dentures, which of course have a specific certification because they are recorded as medical devices 
And these dedical devices, especially in Europe, they have a specific law which obliges oblige dentists to give certification to patients on the medical device, the prosthetics that has been delivered. And that certificate has a lot of information regarding what has been done and on the patient and can be used for identification. Also, we have uh, patients that might have been using uh, bites, bite marks, uh, not bite marks, I'm sorry, uh, bites, which the, the night guards when you are bruxes or when you clench and because you suffer from bruxism. And this night guard can be found at home and can be a, a resource not only for the shapes of teeth, but also for saliva traces. Also, we dentists and dental hygienists, we perform the whitening process, whitening process using, using bleaching trays like this one that you see here. And these trays can be, could still be at home of the missing persons because uh, that person has been doing uh, a, a bleaching, a, a vital teeth bleaching in the past. And also this, this uh, tray, as you can see, has the shapes of teeth and can be used to duplicate the dental arches of the missing person and could also be used to trace saliva and have DNA sampling. Finally, we finally, but it's not the last uh, slide, we can also find in the house of the missing old orthodontic retainers because the person has been doing uh, an orthodontic treatment. Then we have pictures of the missing person. These pictures can show piercing on the tongue, on the tooth, on a specific tooth, and these piercings are well known by the people who live together with the missing person. Or if this person is a sport person, he may have been using a sport mouth guard, which can be found somewhere in the house. Also, we can start asking the dental clinics where the missing persons have been treated for dental and orthodontic uh, treatments because they may still keep study models. And study models, as you can see, are very important because they can show us also extra features, extra identifying features like the palatal rugae, which can be used for the identification process in the comparison with the, with the palatal rugae of the deceased. We can also ask families to contact the curing the, the dental, the dentist of the family, because most of dentists nowadays record uh, clinically the patient with pictures before, during, and after the treatment. And of course, these pictures on, upon the request of the families of the missing can be uh, made available to the family and the family can transfer these pictures to the police. These pictures are very important because, of course, they show frontal teeth and frontal teeth can have some, so many identifying features. As you can see, as we can see also in simple portrait pictures showing the frontal teeth of the missing person. For example, you can see in this case the diastema between the two central incisors. Or we can ask also if there are any selfie images recorded where we can find the diastemas, rotated or wrongly positioned teeth. We can find lip anomalies and these uh, rotations, malpositions, and also signs of uh, recognizable dental crowns or fixed prosthetics. Dental piercing as we showed. Another interesting characteristic that we can find and we can ask to, from, uh, we can obtain from the family of the missing person is uh, the oral hygiene status. The oral hygiene status, the oral hygiene status is what we, uh, oh, sorry. The oral hygiene status, which is uh, 
the oral hygiene habits of the missing person because from the oral hygiene status of a person we can obtain specific information like if the person has a poor oral hygiene if it, he or she is dentally neglected if uh, there is uh, the use or abuse of alcohol or tobacco and all these features are identifying features because these features of the missing person can also be found when we perform the dental autopsy on uh, the unidentified human remains. So the oral hygiene practices of the missing persons, these characteristics, these conditions may be found on the dental autopsy of the unidentified person where we are performing our, uh, our post-mortem dental data collection. So this is why forensic odontologists should always be involved when there is the need of a human identification process, of course, when jaws and teeth are present. And uh, we have seen that the failure to involve, uh, to perform a complete dental autopsy, which has to include a full X-ray images, can, can lead to a delay in the positive identification and to a, a violation of the human rights of the dead. This is something we, we have been saying since 2012 because uh, only because the lack of uh, involving forensic odontologists and to perform a complete dental autopsy can really delay a positive identification. On the other hand, forensic odontologists are fundamental also in age estimations. Consider that there are uh, six million children who still don't have their date of birth registered. And for this reason, age estimation using, using dental methods is so important when we perform, and we need to perform a dental age estimation. Imagine how important it is from a human rights point of view, not only of the deceased, but also or of, uh, of a child he, he, to have uh, an identity. But the identity of a living person is an identity which comes not only from a name, but also from a registered date of birth. In order to have rights, we must have a name, we must have an identity, but we must also have a date of birth. Now, having said that, includes the uh, concept and the ideas relate to the importance of humanitarian forensic odontology, I would like to share with you this, uh, uh, this late, this uh, actual uh, issue of the COVID-19, because together with the uh, Emlata Pande and the Francesco Lupariello from the University of Turin, who is a forensic pathologist, we decided that uh, it was very important for us as odontologists to start thinking about the risks of performing a dental autopsy on unidentified human remains which are SARS-CoV-2 positive. Although there are, until today, there are no cases where forensic uh, pathologists have been uh, 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 have been uh, having uh, to, uh, to 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 be have been become have become infected out of uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, cases, and uh, although there has been so many, I, I, there has been already uh, autopsies on these patients. We right now don't record until today cases where we have to perform an identifying autopsy because the identification that have been done until today have been done on patient. And of course, if we consider that we have a, a, an history, a medical history of a patient, we of course have a name and, and a surname, so we don't need to perform any identification autopsy. The autopsy is performed for forensic reasons, for other reasons. Never, nevertheless, we have the we we think that having a pandemic outbreak of COVID nineteen 
which has reached 185 countries, considered that the world has 194 countries altogether. So we, uh, we thought that, that, especially with elderly people, there are more people who are living alone in houses, that we could face the situation of having to perform and identifying autopsies on deceased who cannot be recognized visually. And for this reason, again, we have to apply best practice in human identification. And best practice in human identification means that we have to apply, first of all, the a collection of primary identifiers data, which includes fingerprints, DNA, and dental data. So we uh, wrote last week, uh, 10 days ago, more or less, we wrote an article, which is in, on the Forensic Science International Synergy, which it has been accepted for our publication. The article dental autopsy recommendations in SARS-CoV-2 infections and we thought that it was extremely important for colleagues who could be involved in dental autopsy to learn or to highlight in, in detail our recommendations to track ourselves on the infection. Here itself, I can, you can see here, the concept is, of, of course, the questions which we have already in our clinical experience, because the other issue about SARS-CoV-2 positive patients is not only the autopsies, but is the treating of patients. So dentists are already aware of the limits and of the problems that we will have to face after the uh, when the lockdown will be over and one of the issue is of course to have a double protection and uh, what we discuss in the article are the recommendations related to dental autopsy and you can hear you can, here i show you what are the specific recommendations in terms of how to protect ourselves you can see, of course, we have to wear a surgical uniform, which is underneath in light blue. Over, we have to have uh, scrubs with log sleeves, waterproof or fluid resistant. The waterproof is the one beneath this green one. Actually, here you find three layers because this is the uniform. And under, over, you have a waterproof gown. And over, you have another another uh, another protection of course here is not shown because this is a clinical picture but when we perform an autopsy we also have to have uh, disposable apnea here on the chest coding which must be of course waterproof as well to have double non-sterile gloves preferably as you can see nitrile gloves and of course, gloves must extend to cover the wrist. And the second nitri gloves can be also changed frequently if we have to take some instruments. In case we have to perform some surgical uh, actions, like for example, the need to create, to do some incision on the, on the lateral of the face in order to open the cheeks and see, observe the internal areas of the mouth, we want to use heavy duty gloves in order to avoid any cutting. Um, we also need to use Googles and a plastic face shield or face mask in order to protect face, eyes, nose and mouth. Here, as you can see, we suggest to use, uh, uh, of course, class, uh, class 3 or class 2 filter these masks, which are also known as FFP2 or FFP3. And we suggest to use over this FFP2 or FFP3 mask, the surgical masks. So we have two masks. And of course, the FFP3 is suggested as only, only if there are aerosol production. 
And finally, we have to, uh, of course, wear rubber boots, which is not here in this show, in this picture, because again, this is a clinical picture. We can use, we are asked to use rubber boots and waterproof shoe protections. And of course, surgical cap, like the one you can see here. Um, having said that, I thank you for your attention and I am open to any questions from the audience. There is a one question from the Sudansu. Uh, what is the need of dental autopsy in SARS-CoV-19? What is the need? What is the need of dental? Uh, what is the need, of course? Uh, the, the need of a dental autopsy in SARS-CoV-2 positive people is only when there is uh, the need of identifying that person. We don't have until today cases where human identification has been required, but we have to expect, considering the pandemic condition and considering the number of diseased, we have to consider that there is the potential risk that we will have to face autopsies of, uh, you, of people that cannot be recognized visually. And for this reason, an, a, an identification autopsy may be requested by a forensic pathologist. That's why there is this risk. I'm not saying that you are performing a dental autopsy in patients because patients have a medical history, have a name already. So we don't need any identifying post-mortem uh, collection. But uh, considering the number of victims and considering that this pandemic and this virus will be, in, uh, will be uh, re at risk of contagious, of infection, uh, most likely all, to t all this year until December, we may find situations where we could have to perform dental autopsy for identification purposes on uh, people on whom you are required, since there is the pandemic, <coughs> to test if they are positive on SARS-CoV-2. Yeah, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, Professor Goria also, Goria, sir, on to ask one question. Professor Goria, sir. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Professor Milio, okay, for your nice presentation. I just uh, have one thing that uh, uh, forensic human, human forensic odontology, uh, will it not be better uh, if we have uh, some team or teamwork? So in every state of India, for example, in every state of uh, every region of the different countries so that we can form some teams uh, of uh, forensic scientists, forensic uh, pathologists and forensic uh, odontologists so that the humanitarian forensic services can be provided in a better manner? I totally agree, President. Uh, uh, in fact, it is in our bylaws that we have to create a humanitarian forensic team. And we started, we, we called uh, the availability some months ago, last year, and I have a list of colleagues who offer availability because one of the issue is that, of course, in order to create a team, you have to require a huge experience because we need to have in the team people that can, don't need to be briefed, people that have enough experience and training to be uh, deployed without any explanation because they have the experience and they have the attitude of team working. So this is exactly the point, Professor Goria. You got that. We are, as an association, we are trying to find colleagues who are available on several countries. Consider that now our association has members from over 20 countries. So we would like to have one or more colleagues available. It's not easy because uh, uh, performing as a volunteer means that you have to support your own expenses. This doesn't mean that in the future we won't be able to support these expenses because our availability as association, when it will be requested, 
will not be will not come from uh, any a personal uh, initiatives but will come from a specific and formal request of international ngos so we will act we we, we will go and offer our uh, pro bono services on the basis of a formal request of an NGO uh, and for this reason we may find our uh, uh, traveling expenses being supported by them. But as you said, it is important to uh, identify colleagues and have, uh, let's say, a, a task force uh, to and colleagues available to be deployed off or short wherever there is the need we hope never to be employed as experts in human identification thank you very much yeah thank you there, there is a one question from dr sweta sarma she is asking is there any difference between a pp of a medical personnel and that for the odontologist no there isn't uh, a specific differences. Actually, there is no difference between the medical, the forensic pathologist and the forensic odontologist uh, protection uh, equipment. There are some specific uh, aspects that we have uh, explored uh, in our article, which are specifically related to dental autopsies, like uh, the need of doing uh, the dental periapical x-rays and also where to do this periapical x-rays. You will read this very soon because the article will be out and will be open as it is one of those articles related to COVID-19 will be open to all scientists, to all interested. Yeah, uh, Nanita, uh, Nanita raised the hand, so Nanita, you can ask your question directly. Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Emilio, it was really good presentation. Thank you. Yeah, and I do have one question. As postgraduate students, we, have been, uh, we haven't been seeing patients on a regular basis now. I'd like to know if there are any specific oral manifestations to uh, SARS-CoV-2 patients who are positive. I love uh, could you please repeat the question? Yes, sir. Can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, 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 so, are there any oral manifestations to patients? No, there, isn't, uh, there aren't any specific manifestations. And uh, this is uh, why it is advised that uh, when we, in this period, until December, in this period of pandemic, if we have to perform, if we are asked to perform human identification uh, uh, process, autopsies on human remains, uh, and we don't have any, any data on this person, so we have to uh, presume that it could be positive to SARS-CoV-2. For this reason, it is advised to perform the uh, the test from the nose in order to uh, uh, identify in order to do the test for COVID-19 because having the the COVID-19 being uh, pandemic for this outbreak all the autopsies where we as odontologists are asked to perform and we have no clues we have no information no data whatsoever about this case we cannot exclude that the person is SARS-CoV-2 positive. So for this reason, before starting the test, we are asked to, uh, we have to, first of all, we have to discuss the case with the medical examiner because when we perform a dental autopsy, we always have to have a confrontation with the medical examiner in charge of the autopsy. And we advise to perform a SARS-CoV-2 test to verify if the unidentified person is positive or negative. But there are no specific manifestations. Of course, there could, there are, if uh, they are associated. If there are, they are the usual manifestations of the uh, uh, pneumonia infections. In this case, we would be um, uh, informed by the medical examiner about them. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Emilio. Thank you, thank you Dr. Ranjit. Uh, there is another question from Dr. Karpal. Uh, in a fire disaster, can you highlight the role of forensic dentist as entire body is burned to assess and teeth and bones will be the only remain for the identification? Uh, this is exactly one of the reasons why we 
uh, strongly promote forensic odontology and the systematic involvement on forensic odontologists. Because out of the three primary identifiers, fingerprints, DNA, and, de and dental methods, in the case you, the, the, I got the question from the colleague, it's the specific case, it's one of those areas where forensic odontology is the most important discipline to be applied because on a carbonized human remains, you only have, are left with the bones and teeth which keep identifying features. You cannot collect any fingerprints. Uh, maybe you can collect some DNA, but you can collect DNA out of teeth, practically. So in these cases, yes, forensic odontology, it's surely the most important areas. And especially in these cases, you have to perform X-rays because out of the, the identifying features of teeth, you need to keep records of X-rays of these teeth because you have to understand and you have to record because if the burnt bones and human remains, burnt teeth are extremely fragile and before they come into powder, before they go into pieces, you have to handle with extremely care and perform X-rays of these teeth as soon as possible. Uh, Emilio, uh, there's, uh, Ranjit Varman, there's very one uh, very important question from one of the postgraduate students who said that uh, as a postgraduate student, they need practice. Is there any way for these students to have a hands-on practice in your university or those uh, people, senior people who are attending the lecture for uh, exchange program or some hands-on uh, experience for that? Um, we could discuss this issue. Um, there could be areas where we can do an exchange program because uh, Turin is a very big university in Italy, is the fifth university in Italy, but it's not only a matter of being big from a physical point of view or from the uh, office's point of view. In Turin, we have uh, uh, two very important collections of uh, re human remains. We have the Egyptian collection, and we have also a collection of skulls of the Anatomy Museum, which collect, which uh, holds over 1,000 skulls of uh, known age and sex. In fact, the, the postgraduate uh, uh, colleagues that are attending this year uh, postgraduate diploma, uh, postgraduate course in forensic odontology, we will perform an hands-on training in June, or if not possible in June, in July. We, they, will be, they, will be, they will perform hands-on on the Egyptian collection, because in, in Turin we also have uh, the Egyptian Museum, which is the second biggest Egyptian museum after Cairo, of course, and uh, this allows us uh, to have facilities for this kind of, of for this kind of training. In order to plan an exchange program, we can discuss this, of course. Uh, consider that the forensic <coughs> odontology laboratory in the University of Turin was established January 2019, which is one year ago when I was. Uh, employed as a forensic odontologist. So we are still working on, uh, on the improvements required to have a human identification laboratory. But I think that it is something that we can really still surely discuss. Uh, there are a few questions which uh, uh, Dr. E.B. Antoro has read. So I request Dr. E.B. Antoro to uh, address that question so that Professor Emilio can answer. Sorry, which one? Uh, any question, like uh, you have uh, read few questions. So uh, due to the multiple chat, I'm not able to read all the questions. So I request you if you can address that question to the Professor Emilio and he can answer those questions. Okay, uh, it's uh, from Aksai. If, uh, I think it is already asking or not, what, what is the percentage transmission of the virus or getting infected during the dental autopsy of COVID disease? We don't have this uh, data. 
we don't have this data because uh, we uh, there isn't there was a, a recorded cases in uh, in uh, in the in the literature which we put in our article but that was corrected by the authors so until now there is no cases of uh, uh, medical examiners or pathologists being infected during uh, an autopsy so we and also we don't have enough other data to reply to that av so but uh, i i think that the, the risk is zero if we are well equipped and uh, perfectly protected just like you do when you do your <coughs> autopsy I'm looking forward to your presentation av okay. okay the next one is a uh, how long can a removable applicant applicant applicants can be used for dna analysis like the dental useful oh i see uh, well uh, i was referring to a specific uh, uh, norm law we have in europe i don't know uh, what is the condition outside european uh, countries this law is a law referred to all medical devices not only dental anything you apply on the body of a person has to be certified and has to have uh, uh, a certification so that uh, the uh, user knows exactly what are the material that it was used what are the uh, the specific instructions on how to use it and these certificates are given to people that use or buy any medical devices dental prosthetics are part of these medical devices because they are of a person are specific done for that person and of course the family of the missing persons must hold somewhere these certifications because the dentists are obliged to give these certifications to patients now out of these certifications you have the name of the dental laboratory who has created or has manufactured that prosthetics and by calling that laboratory you can have information about the dentist about the material and about eventually about the patient the, the the issue is that in the identification process all information just like in a puzzle all information that can have identifying feature have to be collected in the identification process so all the information about dental prosthetics together with other information of course can be added in order to narrow the search in order to achieve a biological generic profile of the unidentified human remain because that is the purpose even if you don't have any anthemortem data available of the unidentified human remain you as odontologists are the only forensic expert that can achieve a generic profile of the deceased which allows police to narrow the search for possible compatible who are missing okay the next question is do you know how uh, the ideal gsm for ppa personal protection equipment how many gsm is it what is standard. GSM? It's a thickness. Uh, of the thickness, the thickness, of, the standard. The the thickness standard. of the PPE. Yes. Uh, the, the, this is uh, uh, something, uh, we refer to the guidelines that have been uh, published by the Center for Disease Control in USA and uh, in UK. The standards are within the, uh, the code of the PPE themselves because uh, when we refer to specific PPE when we buy them you can see the features and the technical aspects within what we are collecting so in terms of numbers I cannot tell you because uh, I refer to these certifications that you find when you buy masks and when you buy personal PPE okay uh, the, the the ICRC is using the 75 GSM. <coughs> so, uh, the, the, the next question is, 
Um, it is necessary to perform the dental autopsy in every autopsy cases or what are the indications for dental autopsy? If we are asked, if the, no, we are asked, sorry, if there is the need to identify one or more human remains, the respect of best practices in human identification require that the dental autopsy must be performed. So dental autopsy must be performed in <coughs> all cases where you are, uh, with, when you want to achieve or you want to try to achieve a human identification, which means that dental autopsy must always be included with all the post-mortem data collections that are performed by the other forensic experts like the pathologist, the anthropologist, and the biologist. In some cases, like for example the SARS-CoV-2 cases, of course we have to balance the safety of the expert who should perform the autopsy. So if we are not in the position to be safe in terms of PPE, for example, if we are not sure that we, and the case is positive, and the case is SARS-CoV-2 positive, for example, we have uh, the priority is our safety. So we don't want to perform a dental autopsy is the risk, if there is uh, the risk of contagious, not because there is the risk, but because we are not adequately protected from this risk. In that case, we could discuss the issue with the forensic pathologist and uh, since there isn't a real medical urgency in performing an autopsy, we may delay the dental autopsy to a stage where PPE are available and perform our dental autopsy only when we are securely and safe with the right PPE. I don't know if you agree, Edith. So, yes, Dr. Uh, thank you. I have so much agree because we always we always do the safety first. And I think this is the last question, Ranjit, I think, is from yes, uh, uh, Dan Sulmani. Is there any option in forensic odontology for the student to... Per uh, sorry, Evi, uh, we lost... Sweden, the India audio. or outside India? We, yeah, we lost sorry. The, is there lost any option? Is there any option in forensic odontology for the student who would like to pursue their graduation in forensic science within India or outside India? Which, uh, you, which places you recommend it? Uh, well, there are several uh, universities that deliver training in forensic odontology and those universities deliver masters in forensic odontology and within the master degree there are hands-on training. We have a, a very good master degree program in Dundee in the Scotland in UK. We have a master degree program in Leuven at the University uh, of Catholic University of Leuven in Belgium. We have a, a, a master degree in Canada with Professor Robert Dorion on, which has also some distance learning module. You have uh, some master's degree in Gujarat University in India, uh, where I've been. I don't know if there is a specific uh, uh, training on, uh, uh, started on forensic odontology, but we know that there are several forensic odontologists with experience in this university. There are other universities in India who are doing a lot of uh, training in forensic odontology. One is led by uh, Professor Pandey. One is led by the uh, Professor Niraji himself. And uh, I'm sure that there are opportunities in India. If you want to try and go abroad, of course, you, have, uh, the, you are required to stay abroad for a longer period. Even Turin nowadays is offering for the first time this training in forensic odontology. It's not a master program. It's uh, a postgraduate diploma because uh, 
we have uh, every month we have a meeting with our uh, postgraduates, but uh, uh, this is something that must be tailored with the specific need of the colleague because it depends if you are already working as a dentist, uh, if you can leave your country for six months, for one year, or you can't, depends on the funding, the financial resources, depends also on uh, uh, other specific conditions like where you start, because uh, there are several short courses which I would suggest uh, uh, colleagues to start with, for example, the short courses organized by the International Organization of Forensic Odontology, which are one-week courses, or even single one-day, two-day workshops, like the one that we have performed with you, Avi, with you, Ranjit, and with you, Emlata, in Sudan, where we performed, we delivered a workshop on DVI. You can start by attending short courses, and then you have a, a better idea on where you want to end up as a forensic odontologist. And I think we have covered all the questions. So if any participant has a question, they can email to us and we are planning to answer all the questions through one blog. We'll take all the questions and uh, we'll take answer from the experts and then we can uh, answer so that uh, everyone can read the questions and answers. We'll cover these questions also, which is asked during the lecture.